What is up guys and gals? Welcome back to the Nerdcastle for the next episode of Mordheim. So things are going to shift a little bit from this point onwards in this series. So basically I did what I said I was going to do in the first couple episodes. I basically played this game all weekend. I played all the armies of all the types. I got to like level... I mean I got up there. I played the game a lot. I think I put in about 20 hours this weekend. And so I have a much better appreciation for how the game plays at this moment. I think that I'll do my best to sort of fill in the points that I missed on my way back up. But I actually at this point... It's funny, when I started recording this series, the Mercs were the ones I was the most experienced with. And at this point, I am no longer that experienced with the Mercs by comparison to, say, like, Chaos or Skaven, who I've played a ton over the weekend. So anyways, our army is looking pretty good right now. It looks like our warband just expanded, although there's a caveat to be had here. The more people you add to your warband, the more randomness you're introducing to the game. And it's going to be largely due to the fact that the game auto-balances teams. And so the less people you bring the less chaotic the game is and by that token the easier it is and so let's say that you constantly play with only like three guys in your warband it'll actually be pretty easy to win the game four guys is pretty easy as well five is usually what i run because once you have six or seven people in your group it just gets too chaotic the enemy has too many heroes and things like that and it just gets really really wild and crazy to the extent that everything the maps are too small to support that many people on it so they get kind of zerg mobby and just a little bit nasty everything turns into a slugfest and so obviously I may actually only bring five guys into battle from now on I've also I forgot to talk to you guys about the special abilities that each of these characters have so this guy right here is swift reaction it just makes him have a really high parry chance that means whenever you have one of these random like leader captain guys you should always be focusing him you should focus them on parry because they've already got the point spent right there for the freebie for the freebie parry bonus. So anyways, they're good at it, so you might as well work in that direction to save the points from agility, which hopefully I didn't put any points into his agility. I really hope that I didn't. If I did, I sincerely apologize. It was a dumb mistake. This guy over here has an ability called Squire's Curse. Basically makes it so that if he runs up on a bowman or a gunman, he can use this and it locks them with their bow. They can't swap weapons so that they have to like waste their next turn and just stand there. Pretty decent ability. Don't use it very often though because it's highly situational. Usually I'll have him on the front lines fighting with other people rather than running down archers. These guys over here have an ability called Momentum, which actually comes at its maximum rank already. It's already mastered. And so after you hit an enemy, your melee hit chance goes up by 20% on your next attack. That'd be super cool if they had the AP to attack twice in one turn, but they do not. And so I think once he levels up to 2 or 3, he might get another point. But I actually think it may be more satisfactory. I'll go through their equipment in just a minute. Anyways, this guy's got an ability called Chain Shot, which means that after he deals damage in range, so if he hits, he has 10% higher chance to hit with the next shot. Eh, you know, archers, I really, really like the Chaos Archers. The Chaos Archers are crazy good. I also like throwing shurikens with the Ratmen, the Skaven. However, I'll have to play around with him a little bit more. Oh, he's getting all excited about it. You heard me say, Ooh, are you going to play with me? I'm excited about this. Come play with me. I don't know who I'm going to bring along, but obviously I don't think we should be running... Let's see here. Falkenberg, Elton John, Schwartzhain. I'll probably swap somebody in for either Schwartzhain. Yeah, I'll probably I'll probably swap out Schwartzhain. All these guys have equal XP. So without further ado, we gotta take a look at our objectives. I think we've got fifty-three pounds or fifty-three stone of the word stone or warp stone or whatever it is that we have. We could send that off to get paid if we can get the other 50 pounds. We have nine days left until it has to be delivered, and so we're in really, really good shape as far as that's concerned. Let's have a look at the shop and make sure that there's not something we can't add here. The dueling pistols right there, those can go onto our young blood. I don't think I want to run him with guns, though. I think I'm going to keep my young blood in melee for right now because, I don't know. The group that I like to run with some, I talked bad about archers. However, I've had some limited success in my other playthroughs running a young blood a leader, two archers, and one extra melee guy. And it's worked pretty well with overwatch and aim shots and chain shot and all that kind of stuff. I'm still kind of leaning towards it. In fact, I may. We have 118 gold coins left. Let's go to the shop real fast and let's see if we can get some guys equipped out. I still haven't named them or anything like that because you got to hit at least level two before I name you. Yeah, I got to be, I got to have some assurance that you're going to be around for a while. Now, given the fact that the game level balances, Eh, naming them is kind of relative because the enemy levels up every time you level up, but... Ah, well. He's got a super awesome feather hat. What kind of stuff do we have over here? Mandrake Root and Crimson Shade. Uh, the Crimson sh Shade might be useful, but honestly, the 10 gold coins we get out of settling both of those is probably better. Got clothing right there. Okay, so that means that, realistically, I would love to put him in heavy armor 
if at all possible. This game is kind of one of those situations where it's dumb to go in on light armor, in my opinion, because you're already taking fat penalties, so you might as well just go all in and put on heavy armor and just be like, YOLO, and just kind of like let it happen. I, I would strongly recommend it. He's going to lose a lot of initiative because of that, but he's going to be pretty, indi well, not indestructible, but 25% less damage is 25% less damage. And believe me, once you start sinking sledgehammer hits for 20, 25, or I'm sorry, for 80 and 85 damage, that 25% becomes a lot more apparent. It's the difference between being one-shotted and two-shotted on a crit. So I'd be careful about it. Sledgehammers are kind of in a weird place right now in-game. Kind of in a weird place. So there we go. He's now got heavier armor. We'll try that out for a match or two. If it ends up not working out very well, I'm perfectly fine with going back to light armor. We probably could have picked up the heavy armor from like a random battlefield loot situation. But for right now, I'm going to leave it where it's at. He's looking okay. He's got an amulet that we can equip. Oh, we can buy an amulet. Okay, do I have any amulets? Nope, my amulets are gone. All right, well, we don't have anything right there. Part of me is debating whether or not it's smart with these guys to take the second weapon off. If you take the second weapon off, first and foremost, that's actually going to raise his initiative a little bit. And then, if you only have a weapon in your main hand and not in your offhand, you get plus 10% to dodge, which would put him up to almost a coin flip as far as getting hit is concerned, whereas 35% is a little bit lower to where I wouldn't depend on it. I'd kind of plan as though he's going to get hit, whereas at 50%, I would start planning around the fact that he might dodge it. That being said, however... You ever have, like, one of those weird, like, really, really aggressive itches? Like, an itch that's so aggressive that you can't ignore it. Like, sometimes you can ignore an itch if it's just, like, small and benign. But, like, one of those itches where it feels like somebody's just digging a needle into the side of your head or whatever itches. That's what I feel right now. I'm just like, yeah, it needs to be itched. Those damn fleas. Those damn fleas. This guy's got a sword and a dagger. Meinhall Schwartzhain. Actually, I'd probably say that we should cut... Did I go agility on him? I'll probably take agility up to 9. You should actually be planning these because you only have a limited amount of points. And these points are required for buying abilities. It's one of the things that I've learned as I've been playing. So I'll probably take his agility to 9 to get him to the point where... That'll give him 4 more. That'll give him 55. And if I take a weapon off, it'll give him a 65% chance to dodge. I don't know if it's a super smart idea. I don't know how to plan characters in this game, but dodge seems to be pretty universally useful. As far as I'm concerned, I'll, obviously I want to take a look at some of these mental abilities too and try and figure out where we want to go with that. Some of the strength abilities, I don't know. I haven't been super impressed with the abilities so far in this game. Like, they're alright, but I haven't been like amazingly impressed by them. Basically, I want the leveled up guy, I want the sword guy. So Gunner, so Gunner and Schwartzhain are coming, and actually it might be Elton John that gets dumped so that we can bring the archer along. Just so I could put him out there in combat, although I find that archers are best applied in numbers. Like, if you have, like, two or three archers, they can do a lot more damage than just one archer. And then, all your melee guys have to do is hold the line while your archers sit on a roof and just pelt things with arrows. It's a pretty sweet ability. Alright, so on our campaign list, what do we have going on? What do we draw for the day? So we got a normal difficulty, which is poor and very poor. We got a hard difficulty, which is poor and average. Both of these are a bad call. And so now the choice would be, do we want to send out a scout, spend a little bit of money on RNG to see if maybe we can get a better mission out, because both of these are pretty terrible. I... Yeah. So we got a Brutal, and this one has exceptional loot, and it has exceptional Wordstone. Both Warbands are scattered randomly around the area, scared by something. See, I don't like that map configuration. This one would be a nice idea if this map, it doesn't let you deploy your guys and there's all over the place on the map. And so given the fact that the enemy already has an advantage in terms of numbers and or levels because it's a brutal difficulty mission, I would like to deploy as condensed as possible and I want to have as much control over that fight as possible so I can force the enemy to fight outside their comfort zone. For right now, I think I'll probably go with pillagers. I like this map configuration a little bit better, exploring buildings versus strike teams. Both of these I have a chance of being the team that gets deployed all over the place, and that's basically a death sentence for somebody. So I'll go with this one over here, unless we can regroup rapidly, I guess that would be the other half of it. And so we were getting rid of... We are going to take out Elton John. Elton John's out for right now, and we're going to fight this 5v5, because I think that's probably our wisest plan. Your scouts report to you 
that a rival warband has been spotted in the area pillaging houses. While they are dispersed and distracted, you deploy your own patrols in the hope of surprising the enemy. So let's have a look at the deployment that we've drawn here. It's actually not so bad. We'll want to focus, so you can press the shift key. I didn't know about it in the first couple episodes because, you know, I'm a giant noob. Not that big of a deal, though. I actually kind of like the game better without a map. In all honesty, it makes it feel a little bit more claustrophobic and worrying. We started out on this side of the map. They're going to start out in this little circular area right here. What we'll want to do is we want to get deployed. I mean, if I can get everybody in right here, it looks like that's four guys. And then I'll have one guy over here who's got to cross the T and run all the way back. It's risky, but I think I can make it happen. So we'll want to put four guys over here and one of our heroes with high movement over here. And then we'll have him blaze it all the way back over to this side to try and regroup with everybody else as time allows. And we've got to really, really hope that the enemy doesn't get a deployment that's like right here or like right here or something like that. Because sometimes the deployment's a little bit weird in this game where the enemy can end up in some very, very odd spots earlier than you plan on them being there. And actually, I'd like to take a look at that over there before we do too much. I'm going to go ahead and drop these cats off over here. And then I think Leonhardt von Falkenberg, I definitely don't want him down there. That would be the worst plan for deployment ever. I think I would like him, did that drag him back in over here? So can I go through this house right here? Basically I'm looking for the best, most plausible escape route to avoid having to fiddle around with the enemy being kind of ahead of me here. He turns around and goes backwards. I wonder if he can get through that building over there. I don't see anything that looks like open spacing, but there's got to be a way around the roads right here. I think I could probably jump up right there, but given the fact that he's got heavy armor, that may not play out well. Ah, well, what are you going to do? I'll play him forward, I guess. All right. So let's see who deploys first. I really, really, really hope they can't get close enough to this guy to cause me some problems. That would be the worst. Oh, good. They have a morale advantage, too. That'll be funsies. And we're up against the Sisters of Sigmar, too. Great. Okay. Well, we've definitely got somebody that's going to win if we try and duke it out with them on the ground. I'm usually not a fan of duking on the ground. We have facilities for those sorts of things. Best to remember Civilization Ho and all that. I... Well... I'm looking for that word stone because our secondary objective is to pick up seven word stones. Which in this situation I think could be accomplished. So there's a scavenge point over there and there's a whole bunch of word stone directly behind him. So is it inside this building right here? What are we looking at? I'm going to be careful about... Is that loot right there? What is that? Oh, it is. Okay, so I can't loot that without ending my turn. But, because it locks your... I'm not, I didn't explain that well enough. I left that a little bit ambiguous. When you open a chest, it finalizes your movement point so that you can't run around and scout. I think you can only do this... I mean, it says it's in here. But anyways, you can only run around... I don't know if you can run around like this in multiplayer, like if that's even an option. I can't see up top. I'd really like to set up somewhere where my archer can help out with the ensuing chaos here. So let's say that I deploy right, yeah, exactly. Somebody up like on that catwalk right there. Ooh, on the catwalk, on the catwalk. That'd work for me. That'd sound good. Although that definitely takes us away from our secondary objective, which at this time... Oh, look at that. Somebody has... Can he see her? She's down there. I think the draw distance is too shallow for right now. And so that's unfortunately going to finalize his turn. I stepped on a booby trap right there. It was my fault. I was trying to pan and scan around to see where she was at and messed it on up. Yeah, I think I'd prefer for the fight to happen over here if we can make it happen. And then I'm just going to have to kind of rely on the fact that maybe I can get my other warrior up here. We'll try and get the archer up onto the top floor right there. 
Or at the bare minimum, we'll scoot the fight back a little bit and we'll put the archer up on one of the stairs right there with the melee guys blocking the path so that nobody can get up on the stairs. Either way would work for me. So for right now, I'm actually going to, I guess, go ambush stance if you got nothing else. I've actually, with my playtime over the weekend, I'm not as big of an ambush fan as I used to be. I used to be a big fan of ambushing, and now I actually don't use it quite as often. I find it to be one of those moves where you're dedicating yourself to a strategy, and sometimes you don't want to dedicate to a strategy. Sometimes you just want a little bit. That won't go off twice, so if I go back to here, I think I can almost get him back behind here, so yeah, that works. So anyways, the point that I was moving towards here is that ambush stance locks you into an offensive strategy. Whereas putting yourself in dodge stance or whatever allows you to pick your hits. So when they hit you, you might dodge. And then on top of that, you get to counter strike. Putting yourself in dodge stance seems like a better plan most of the time. In my opinion. Especially if the enemy is about to hit you with a charge or whatever. Because the game can be weird about who gets to ambush and who gets to charge. I'll probably keep him right here. Just kind of out of the way. And if they somehow manage to get to us within one turn, I'm just going to weep and cry. And then I'm just going to be like, ah! and I don't think we're going to go for the secondary objective here. Fighting mobile like that, eh, I don't know. Whenever I go up against the Sisters of Sigmar, they're such a wild card that I don't trust myself when I fight them. And so I tend to go with the ultimate safest strategy I can muster, i.e. turtle-like shit and just hope that they don't beat us in a straight scrum. I think it'll be fine. The Sisters of Sigmar are actually pretty easy if you can catch them isolated. They're really, really good in a group, but they tend to be alone unless they got somebody with a sledgehammer. That's the caveat that I put in right here. The guys with the sledgehammer suck. And by suck, I mean they're really, really good and they make me want to cry because they're not on my team. So let's get home over here. Fly away, home. Fly away. And then I'm going to put him in Overwatch stance. The Chaos guys come with an ability that gives them plus 20% or plus 15% to hit on anybody as long as they're in Overwatch. It's really, really good. Like, it's viciously good. So with the 50% check, he could get up right there. Or we can risk coming around this way. Is there a jump down point right here? So I could have him scavenge from right here. Then on his next turn... Oh, there's a sister right there. Yeah, then on his next turn, I may have him jump down. We'll try and handle one of those sisters quick. Ooh, 24 gold coins. That's a good scavenge spot right there. That's a good scavenge spot. That's how you do scavenge spots right there. Okay. Well, we can't get him where he wants to be, so I'm going to turn him around and go in ambush stance. If he ends up in a fight, it's going to suck. Like, I would really prefer for him not to be in battle right now. When they come around this corner, I'm hoping they catch an arrow. Yeah, there's Sledgehammer Lady. Sledgehammer Lady is a bad call. Like a really, really, really bad call. A new round has started. Sledgehammer Lady is gnarly. She can hit for upwards of 70 damage with one swing. So, like, she's got to go. She's got to be the first to go because she can actually, like, almost one-shot some of the smaller guys. That Sledgehammer is a terrifying weapon. Luckily, she can only swing it once. So, if you rely on heavy dodge or anything like that, you might be able to get away with it. The real issue here is that she's locked him from jumping down, which leaves us in kind of a weird strategy right now. My suggestion would be to leave people in dodge stance. And we're going to let them come to us. Now that it's Lundorf's turn, we're going to try and group up along this side. We're going to leave everybody in dodge stance, because that's really the only way that we're going to win this, considering how much harder they're going to hit me. That character just used a talisman. They've got... A normal... That's one of their normal weakling characters, so... I think we should be able to eliminate her no problem. Yeah, the lack of initiative that we took from that armor being added onto our character is actually a bad thing at this point, because he could have he preempted their turn and jumped down. Alright, so you, sir, reload, and then we'll decide what we want to do with the rest of our time here. He's got a 94% chance to hit the big lady back there. Does that leave him with enough to run away? Hold on. So that leaves him with two AP to run away with. Yeah, go ahead and do it. We need her to go, like, really, really badly. Like, if she doesn't go, we have an issue. And so then we have this guy fall back behind the line of scrimmage so that they can't get at him. Because losing an archer is 
pretty bad. You don't want that to happen. And so you see that chain shot buff that he's got at the bottom left. That's because he made his overwatch and he made this one. And so as long as we can keep that going, he should be able to put an arrow on somebody every turn from here on in. I hope. I'm actually going to delay the leader's turn. Yep, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to take that. I'm going to delay it. And by delaying his turn, that allows the enemy a chance to sort of just like... Your dodge chance is only 25%, Schwartz. Ugh, have you not been leveled? I think he must not have been leveled. This might be problematic. So she went with a Bugman's Ale. I can't recall. Ah, that's unfortunate. That's really unfortunate. Uh, that ambush stance is going to lock this guy down. So he can't really do much. If I Let me see what's back around this way. And see if it would be plausible to retreat back around and jump the fence. No, I can't make it. Shit. What I'd like to see then is if maybe I can get her to jump up. It looks like so far they only have two guys, though, going up against four of ours. So this should just be a mop-up, I think. I'm going to put him in parry stance just in case. A new round has started. And I want to specify I don't like what's happening here. But they're only trickling in, so with two of them we should be able to make this happen, I think. The sledgehammer is still a major, major issue. Like, I worry about that sledgehammer. And on the next turn, it's going to crack down on us. I don't think she can ambush that far. So I think I'm going to bring back the line of scrimmage to here. I think the girl with the shield gets to act next, though. And I think, actually, I don't think I'm going to be able to move. I think she's going to run up on us. Ambush stance is a little sketchy right now because it leaves somebody overextended and away from the line. Let's go ahead and I'm going to leave people in the line to defend the archer as best I can. Although it would be the smartest idea not to leave a hole so that they can't just walk through. Because the AI will totally do stuff like that where there's like a tiny imperceptible hole that a human can't see. But the AI is like, oh look, there's a tiny hole right there. I know that because I scanned the battlefield. And then everything's good for them. I'm going to leave them on dodge mode because they're going to be on top of me in just a minute it might have been a smarter idea to delay them actually so that I could collapse and then use my attacks on whoever runs up on us ah well strategic foible you guys know that I make those and there goes the charge he made the dodge roll if you wanted to see the actual rolls being made if the game annoys you with its RNG I find that sometimes it's useful to look at the numbers in the combat log by hitting the L key so that I don't feel like I'm being cheated and so anyways, her hit chance is that she has to roll below 60, and she did. And then my character had to roll below 40 in order to dodge, and he did. So what I'm saying here is that sometimes the percentage that you're seeing at the bottom of the screen is not representative of your actual chance to hit. It's just your chance to roll to hit, excluding their chance to dodge or block. And so if the combination was supposed to be correct, I think it would be 76 over 100. And let's say that her dodge or her parry was 30%. I think he goes 76 over 100 times 30 over 100, and that would be your actual percentage. But somebody, it's been about five years since my combinations and permutations class, so somebody would have to fix my logic or my math there if they're wrong. Anyways, the 76 you're seeing right there is just your chance to hit. It's not your chance to hit considering the fact that they get to make a parry or a dodge roll. And I think that leads a lot of players, including myself, until I realized what was happening, to feel like they're being cheated out of like 97% hits and things like that. So anyways, be aware there's a combat log that you can look at, and the dodge rolls are handed separately from the melee hit rolls. And so that's why it'll give you a 95%, but then you'll get dodged by somebody with a 40% chance to dodge. Because it doesn't take the rolls at the exact same time, and it doesn't calculate them in to the overall equation. I'm going to go ahead and counter right there, because it's a lot of damage. I'm a little bit bummed out. I'm a little bit bummed out that he only got to attack once this turn, but I think it's something that I can live with. I'm going to continue trying to get rid of Belly Plate over there. I call the, the old lady that runs the sisters, I call her Belly Plate. I don't know. Because she's got a Belly Plate. I can't jump down until the battle is joined over here, which is all kinds of troublesome. Not unless I want him to be in a, like a little area where he's really, really overextended. I would like to go after you, madam. Never forget that he sold Von Holtzhauser 
is the one that needs to go first. I could do a little bit of damage to Ermina. She's got 30% damage reduction. Yeah, just keep whittling away at her. Yep. Whittling like a redneck on a back porch. Get it done. Get her done. Don't have the AP remaining in order to fight back. Technically, I could drop him down. We could disengage. Oh, it's so sketchy, though. They'll finish her up. Is there anybody else coming down the way? You know, I don't think there is. I think they deployed, like, all over the place right now. They have one right there. You know what? I'm going to play this a little bit more risky than I normally would. Okay, so he made his jump down roll. I don't think he can move without being ambushed, though. But what I can do... I can go for parry stance, which gives us a 50% chance. The AI will probably... No, the AI likes to focus on low HP values, so ambush stance is probably better. I think we're just about out of time for the day, though. My name is Splattercat. I'll see you on the next episode of Mordheim, a game that I have rapidly fallen in love with. I wasn't so sure. When I first started playing, this game has a huge learning curve, and honestly, I'm still a giant noob at it. Even after, like, 20, 30 hours of play, there's a lot of stuff that I'm really just extrapolating and hoping for the best with. But I hope you guys are enjoying the series. I love anything Warhammer Fantasy or 40K, so I'll see you all later. Hi to everybody.